Okay, welcome everyone to uh, our Dia dos Açores commemoration, a commemoration that is being done in the North America continent with uh, a connection to the Azores as well. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, BBBI from California State University, Fresno. Welcome on, on behalf of, uh, of course, uh, this new project that uh, was... Uh, the uh, birth trial of the Symposium Filaments of the Atlantic Heritage. We had uh, a uh, wonderful uh, event uh, that the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute put forth uh, with all of these uh, phenomenal writers and poets. And uh, from the discussion, actually a suggestion by José Raposo came the idea of forming a sort of group uh, that would uh, encompass all who writes in the Azorian diaspora in one way or another. And so after uh, the magic of email and lots of emails back and forth, we came up with this uh, project called uh, and baptized, I should say, by Scott Edward Anderson. He is the padrinho because he gave it the name, as we say it in the Azores. If you give it the name, even though they not be, may not be baptized in the church, but they're legally, you're, you're, you're their padrinho, whether you like it or not. And it was Scott's idea of the, we had lots of different uh, ideas about it. And it was Scott's idea about the Cagarro Colloquium. And so um, after lots of different uh, uh, conversations, we uh, came up also and was initiated by a uh, wonderful um, uh, poet uh, here as well, Lara Goulart, uh, and to come up with our uh, mission statement. And her and Elaine worked together on it and everyone uh, approved it unanimously. So I'd like to share it with everyone. Uh, the Cagarro Colloquium is a literary community of writers in all genres who advocate for and represent new and established writers of the Azorian diaspora and their literary contributions locally, nationally, and internationally. Thank you to big thanks to Lada and Elaine for working together on this. And uh, a little bit as we begin, um, there's a couple of questions. I'll try to address them. Um, we are also on Facebook Live, and for those wanting to join, I'll put on chats in a little bit if I can get the uh, the connection for you to join that way as well. There are quite a few folks uh, joining us on uh, Zoom webinar. I appreciate each and every one of you here locally in California, the East Coast, Canada, uh, Gabriela Silva from the beautiful island of Flores, and uh, uh, people also in the, uh, Portugal itself. And uh, our very good friend, as always, um, uh, Miguel Vaz from the Luz American Development Foundation, FLAT. The, the session will be in commemoration of Dia dos Açores. And um, the Dia dos Açores, or the Day of the Autonomous Region of the Azores, or Azores Day, is a regional holiday in, uh, of course, the Portuguese archipelago of the Azores. It commemorates the establishment of the Azorean political autonomy in the Portuguese constitution uh, following the Carnation Revolution. And the date corresponds to the festival of the Holy Spirit, or Festa do Espírito Santo, a celebration based in the archipelago's religious and cultural history, held on the Sunday of Pentecost. And uh, it is a movable public holiday because the Dia dos Açores is celebrated on, on the Monday after Pentecost Sunday. Um, so in um, this, uh, the idea of autonomy goes back, not just to 1974 and the revolution, it actually goes back to the 19th century in March of, of 1895, a group of Azorians, mainly from the island of San Miguel, began thinking about a process that would give the Azores uh, a better voice than we have had since we were founded, since the archipelago had been inhabited in the 1500s. And so, it, but it was in June of 1976 that the regional elections installed the first legislature of the Azores, followed by the installation of a government for the region and later direct universal local authority elections in December. The Day of the Azores, or designated Dia da Região Autónoma dos Açores, Day of the Autonomous Region of the Azores, as I said, corresponds to the Monday of the Holy Spirit, Segunda Feira do Espírito Santo, also known as Segunda Feira da Pombinha, from the dove of, that, that is represented in the flag of the uh, Espírito Santo. It was legislated by the government of Motamaral on the 21st day of August of 1980, 
under Regional Decree 1389-A. At uh, the original celebrations, apart from representatives from the government, the president of the regional legislature was then uh, Alvaro Monjardino, and the minister of the republic was then Enrique Horta. They were in attendance. The preamble of the regional law that established this uh, uh, day, uh, I'd like to just uh, read you a very brief quote from it. And it says, and I quote, comprised of small communities isolated for centuries, the Azores kept traditions, cults, and popular practices deeply and totally rooted in everyday life and distinct from many other parts of Portugal. Perhaps the most significant of all of them are the celebrations of the Holy Spirit, as festas do Espírito Santo, or o culto do Espírito Santo, that intertwine of the noblest Christian traditions with the celebration of spring, of life, of solidarity and of hope. The vitality of these festas extends naturally to the Azorian diaspora around the world. The celebrations of the Holy Spirit are spontaneous, are as vivid and intense as nature itself is in the islands, because they are the most popular event ingrained deeply within the Azorian idiosyncratic, uh, uh, idiosyncrasy, I should say. It is fair to consecrate this day as an affirmation of the Azorian identity, of the philosophy of life of the Azorians here and beyond, and our regional unity, the base and justification of political autonomy that we recognize with this holiday and that we proudly exercise, end quote. So a little bit about the holiday itself. It is uh, important for the Azores, especially in a new face since the democracy and let me just tell you that as someone who predates 1974 by a while uh, I can tell you that before uh, 1976 and even 1980 and it's still a brand, brand new concept the concept of the Azores was not a really a concept that existed even within the archipelago it was the concept of Terceira, de San Miguel, Flores, Pico, Fayal and everyone was its own island and there's still a little bit of that still but this concept that bringing the whole archipelago as a unity is not is something that is not uh, it was important with and only has been achieved with autonomy. It had not been achieved prior to that. And uh, as I'd like to tell just a little bit about a 45 second story in 19, the early 1960s, there was an earthquake in the island of Saint George. And one of the things that the Salazar regime did was move people from Saint George, who were left homeless, to the island of Terceira. And there was a couple uh, of uh, a family that uh, came to live in the zone of Praia de Vitoria, where I lived. And my grandmother, who normally was a pretty open-minded lady, surprised the living daylights out of me when I was like six years old, maybe five, six. And she said, don't go play with those kids. They're from Saint George. You know, so, uh, you know, like they came from a different world, you know, uh, that we didn't know where they were from. But indeed, Azorians did not know each other. And in many of those bygone, not that far off years. And uh, th that's why political autonomy is very important for the archipelago. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Edward Anderson, who is going to introduce our very special guest of honor from the Azores. And, uh, and we will formalize our program, which will have readings from everyone in attendance here and the, the, all of the poets and writers. Uh, we'll have the music, of course, and uh, we will uh, have also a couple of other things that will uh, surprise you along the way. Scott. Great. Obrigado. Uh, this is a really special guest we have today. Um, fantastic singer-songwriter. Um, I first came across about, I think, three, three or four years ago and um, just blown away by his music. And he's, it seems like um, uh, every, every time I turn around, he has a new single coming out and uh, it's, each one is just uh, better than the last one. So it's uh, really fantastic to have him here all the way from Tosaida. And um, uh, if you don't know uh, Christopher's music, it's um, he had a, sp a hit last spring. It was kind of went viral uh, with uh, Andra Tuto Bene, which was uh, everything will be all right, which became a global phenomenon when uh, when he and Portuguese film director Pedro Varela uh, collaborated and made a video of the song, which uh, you should definitely uh, check it out. Um, in support of frontline workers during the pandemic, it was um, it was uh, in heavy rotation. As is uh, was his first his first album, 
uh, Hopes and Dreams, um, which is, uh, I think my kids are all getting tired of my, my, my playing it on Spotify over and over and over, but uh, uh, that's been a, a fantastic album and had um, uh, uh, a single, Walk in the Rain, um, and a second single, Faith in, Faith in Wine, which won first, first prize at the International Songwriting Competition with a panel of judges, quite a trinity, Tom Waits, Keen, and Lord. Wow. Um, <laughs> welcome, Christopher. Um, Hi. <laughs> I, uh, I understand that your father had an old jukebox of 45s and that um, you started listening to that at an early age. Um, is that what inspired you to start playing and making music? Yeah, in a way, I guess that's, that's a big part of it. But uh, um, my family has always been heavily connected to... Um, to music, despite not having any musicians in the family. But uh, my grandfather was the founder of, um, of Radio Club de Angra, which is uh, the second oldest radio of the Atlantic, um, followed by um, Azas do Atlantic, the radio from Santa Maria is the oldest one. Um, but, uh, and, and because of my father being so connected to my grandfather being so connected to music and and uh, he was a big part of the innovation of, of lightning in, in, in all the town parties that that happen around uh, the islands uh, during the summer. He was the first person who, who had uh, um, lighting rigs that he would place on these festivities. And uh, he, he also had uh, all the PA systems and everything that didn't exist up till then. He was sort of a pioneer in all that. So um, the jukebox story is actually very important because he had three, he had three sons uh, and he bought three uh, jukeboxes that played seven inch records. So uh, wow. the, the way that, the, the reason why he did that is uh, because there were no, no other jukeboxes on the island. And my, my grandfather, I guess, he got a hold of them through the airbase on the island. Uh, um, he managed. He managed to buy there, and then he he would rotate these jukeboxes around the island, and each month he would get new seven-inch singles, and he would replace them, and everyone would gather at at these uh, at these places called Casa do Povo, which are still today exist and 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 are a big part of the communities here. And people would gather there to see what new music was coming in, and uh, and and their monthly wage. My father and my uncles, their monthly wage was the amount of money that the machine would provide during one month. So every month, when they would <laughs> replace the records, they would get the money that they would have for their month. So we, my my father ended up keeping his, and the other two went missing, and. And we never knew where the other two were. And, and it's funny that, that we were talking about this story because about a month ago, we were contacted by this man who said he was getting rid of two jukeboxes that he heard that I had one. And if I might be interested in looking at them, but I had no idea what jukeboxes these were. Sure. And uh, he sent me a picture and I immediately saw that they were exactly the same model as my mm. father's mm. jukebox. <laughs> so the jukebox went away. Those two jukeboxes ended up being my uncle's jukeboxes. They were, they, we had no idea where they were for about 30 years. And uh, they had several owners and they ended up coming back home. And, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and it's crazy that, that we, we then opened the door and, and the, uh, the the stickers that had the names of, of the songs were actually the stickers that my father wrote so oh, as soon as we opened it you, you could tell exactly. that those were <laughs> their jukebox yeah fantastic so yeah I, I grew surrounded by music and 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 uh i since an early age i was sort of obsessed about listening to music and we had a friend who used to play guitar at our family parties and and from watching him play uh, Pink Floyd and Dire Straits and all those bands that, I, that my father used to listen, I, I became very passionate about guitar playing. 
So at 11 years old, I got my first guitar and sort of taught myself uh, hmm. how to play it. And sooner than later, I started writing songs because I thought that was a lot more fun than learning songs from other people. <laughs> and, and because I didn't knew any other musicians, I was sort of forced to learn how to play the other instruments that I wanted to hear in my song. Mm. Mm. So that is how I'm a multi -in instrumentalist. I, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, let's hear a song. Yeah. So I'm going to play a song called The Spin, which is one of my latest singles. Spanish leather We walked from dawn to dawn We prayed for better weather The rain had lingered on And there's a full moon rising in the nose Things will come our way, just you wait and see it. And when they do come, we'll think of the wrong terms. We'll know what they meant, they just you wait and see it. One day they'll tell our story. This train won't ever stop. It moves too fast to worry And you can't turn back the clock So here's to us, my darling Yeah, here's to one more night Our love won't ever cave in I see it in your eyes. And there's a full moon rising, and I know soon things will come our way. Just you wait and see. It. And when they do come, we'll think all the wrong terms. We'll know what they meant. They just you wait and see. It. And we'll dance through all the alleys that we find along the way. Through the mountains and the valleys, we won't stop until we fade. Like Roman candles in the night sky. There's a full moon rising and I know things will come our way. Just you wait and see. And when they do come, we'll think all the wrong things. We'll know what they mean. Just you wait and see. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. so much. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, really great. And thank you. Thank you, Scott, for uh, uh, 
leading that off and for suggesting um, the music parts and for and for and, and for all your work on this. And um, I think that Kishavon's uh, going to stick around a little bit uh, for a second song. Uh, I hope, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, so I'd like to um, actually we kind of changed a little bit of the uh, of the order, but we'll go back to what our, our first uh, poem is going to be. And um, so we asked everyone to. Uh, to read one of her of their one or two of their poems, it's up to you. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, start actually with a poem by Sam Pereira. And the first poem, he'll come back and read a second poem for us later. But the first poem is actually a poem that he wrote, and I'd like him to share the the uh, the inspiration, what it, how it uh, arrived, and how it came to fruition. It's a poem based uh, on the uh, this initiative based on the Kagaru uh, Colloquium. Uh, and uh, Sam, of course, um, is a widely known, as everyone here, uh, poet. And uh, so uh, we're going to kick it off with Sam Pereira and uh, the poem that uh, kind of uh, sets the scene for uh, this uh, new group. Thank you, Denise. Um Actually, I'm only going to read this one poem. It's fairly long, and um, because of that, I, I don't want to take more time than need be. Uh, this is a poem called On the Return Flight of What Was Once a Ship. My uh, grandfather came to the United States from Terceda, uh at the turn of the 20th century, and later uh, brought his wife and uh, their first child, my, my aunt, and the rest of the family was born here in the United States. I'm third generation Portuguese American. And for a long time, I have um, uh, sort of wondered what it would be like to go back to uh, the Portugal of my grandfather, which is impossible, right? But to go back at some point. When I first heard, uh, when we started to talk about the Kagaro, uh, sorry, that's the best I can do as far as pronouncing it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't aware of the bird. And uh, I did some research and in discussion with this group, I became more aware of it and I began to feel a closeness to the bird and a closeness to the idea of going home, flying home. So the person in this poem is a, uh, on a return flight to uh, the islands and sees himself as somewhat crazy and um, not unlike the, the way the bird presents itself, I suppose. On the return flight of what was once a ship. How I got to Teseda from here, the sky mostly, and its freedoms usually happened in the middle of some inconsolable week. Let's say the traffic was thick out of New York Jet fuel had certain similarities to the stuff that ran the boats off the coast of Northern California. And the fish took everything home. Let's be honest. If it wasn't for the bass and a fading memory, I would have never begun this journey home. So, it was the sky, like I'd said before, that wrapped me in the wings of the passing Cagaros, who invited me in for a drink of whatever the elixir was that kept them crazy and in so much demand. Just today, a friend said, I reminded him of that bird and had I ever been to the Azores in my long and industrious life? Not with words this time. There was nothing human about it. A shriek, 
and a blue sky, denoting how insane I had become. We are flying over the Atlantic. It is mid-afternoon and continues to be midweek. My grandmother's ghost is making bread. I know she is. She and all the other ghosts will share their wistful ghost embraces and invite me to their table for dinner. How I got to the islands from here remains a mystery wrapped in bread and the ancient sweat of labor, one of the many religions tossed on the rocks of my life. Before settling here with the dead. A prayer because they insist. A kiss to Henry in the winds that circle the shores of hello and goodbye. I am a Kagaro in some forgotten anger. My scream will always be of home. Thank you. Wonderful. The shores of hello and goodbye. That stuck with me from the beginning. Thank you, Sam. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so there was Sam Pereira, uh, as Gabriela Silva wrote, Tom Lindu, indeed it is. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sam. And uh, we're going to continue uh, our journey through poetry with, uh, with Lara. Okay, you surprised me. I know I like surprises. I change things around a little <laughs> That's bit. That's okay. I do too. Um, I'm going to read a poem uh, about uh, my great great grandmother uh, at the village of Santa Barbara, island of Pico. Looking for my great great grandmother, Maria Francesca de Cabral. My fingernails scraped lava stones, loosened dust. Looking for the other world, I found a fissure in the earth that led to where the sea tossed its wet creatures, their lungs exhaling. The ocean spread dark and cold beneath the night, reached with every wave for drops of light shed by the moon. Musty air and a ghost rattle through banana leaves, you rose up. Bones of family architecture, luminous. A woman without soil, you carved roots from stones of the island. Into the Azorian sea, you dove. The splash of your body, and I jumped, scattering stars to pull toward you. Where ocean and sky met, you vanished. Your memory, the afterlife dissolving all that salt seeped back into the sea, an ocean mist without end. I held my breath, heard the heartbeat of waves, felt the ocean of my blood. My body took pleasure in forgetting gravity, the need for breathing on my own. I asked God to throw me a line. Floating to the shore, I felt the pull of the universe slow everything down as heaven pulled the earth into its arms. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I love that poem. As a matter of fact, I'm going to use a line from that. Or With your permission, I may just steal it from you without your permission, which is Into the Azorian Sea. That's going to be the title of an anthology I'm working on. So I'm going to ask you for that permission uh, because it's a wonderful line, Into the Azorian Sea. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lara. Looking for the other world, indeed. Um, as someone just uh, uh, wrote on one of the comments that uh, these poems are not from people born in the Azores, but it's just like you uh, that all of you feel like uh, the Azores, like it was it's been part of you all of your lives, although 
it, in some cases, uh, some people haven't even been there and others they have, but as visitors and not, of course, living in the Azores, the power of our ancestors. Uh, from, um, from Lara, we'll go to uh, Logan. Righty. Uh, well, this poem that I'm about to read uh, came from some research that I decided to do about the Kagahu when we were talking about the, the title. So I looked into it a little bit more, uh, dove into my, my National Geographic tendencies here, and, um, <laughs> and I found out that in the Azores, the groups of Kagahus that are feeding and flocking are called Jangadas, which would translate literally to rafts. And I thought that was very interesting. And then I was also reading this anthology recently that we recently had an event on by um, Luis Gonçalves and Cabo Matos. And I, I came across a poem by Lara Goulart. And I said, why not write a golden shovel to Lara Goulart's poem? Because Denise mentioned golden shovels not too long ago. And I've always wanted to try my hand at one. So I figured now would be the perfect time. So this poem is titled In the Folds of Dark Sea, and that title is inspired by a line from Lada Goulart's Lost Currents, which appears in that anthology. In the folds of dark sea, sea fowls gather in rafts, rafts not bound by boards nor wound in string, but built by wings and wings, waiting patiently for the time when nature completes its cycle. When the folds of flocking fowls and flopping fish collide in the dark shadows cast by a setting sun on a meandrous sea. In the folds of dark sea, sea fowls sing in their cages, cages with no walls to confine nor wire to withhold, cages where the cluster of kagahu cacophony freely mingles with bottle-nosed whistles and folds with the slow rising crescendo of open, of open ocean swells. Bowed backward points glide across the thin dark surface before a long yellow spear swiftly pierces the sea, giving life to death and nourishment to sacrifice. Very good. <clears throat> Excellent as always. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Logan. Uh, wonderful poem. Logan is, uh, Logan is going places, as we, we can all tell. You know, just as a young poet with lots of talent. Um, and uh, from uh, Logan, we will go to José Raposo. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm really happy that uh, I had the idea of forming this group and really glad also for the caliber of the people that we have. And uh, thanks to Dinesh for continuing and uh, all he did for us to be here today. Uh, I wrote a poem called The Cagarros. Uh, I apologize if I will make some mistake because I'm having a problem with double vision and I don't know the poem by heart, but I'll do my best. The Kagarosh. I left the island. Like so many other things, the Kagarosh came with me. At night, the unique sounds still penetrate my ears. In the darkness, their cacophonic, distorted music still resonates, trumpets from Emily Angels. The reflection of the underwings' whitish feathers, a phantasmagoric image within the dark sky. In my dreams, the longing imprints in my soul of burden, heavy heft. In the morning, awakened by the first sun rays, the ambivalence of Saudade reminds me that I truly never left. Wonderful, wonderful poem and wonderful vision of the immigrants. Thank you, Jose. Um, and uh, and I, I too am glad that we can that we uh, had the event and that we are putting this forth and we'll talk a little bit at the end uh, about 
where we go from here with everyone that is present, whether it be here on uh, the Zoom webinar. And again, thanks to all of you who are on the Zoom webinar and those of you who are making comments. Thanks to Gabriela Silva for all the comments that she's, and I'll try to read them at the end. And thanks to, um, of course, those who are following us on social media as well. And uh, we're going to uh, transition to Elaine, Elaine Avila. She has also reading and uh, 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 interv- uh, piece that we're going to be showing you on a video. Okay, so she will introduce that as well. And I hope that uh, the technological part of it from my end will go well. Hey, Elaine, happy to see you. Nice to have you as well. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I was going to read one short monologue. Do you want to do the video the next round around? Does that work? Or Sure, that, that sure will. Okay, great. Um, I'm bringing in a piece from uh, my project that I did during my Fulbright. Um, can someone, can you see women in oh, the, uh, the Azores war? Happy these, Capel. It's like, <laughs> same, for uh, 400 years, over 400 years. So I did some research into the archives and interviewed contemporary women um, about wearing this capello y capote or capote capello or manto, depending on which island you're from. So I'm going to read a little piece from a woman um, from Fayal in 1836. I found out about her in a little anecdote where a man who was at a party uh, held by the Dabneys made fun of her for her favorite book. So I, so I, I'm wearing my capote today, so I can do my little reading for you. So. <laughs> This is Philomena from 1836. They picked me. I'm the lucky one. I'm the one who gets to read. It costs money to go to school and my parents chose me. I've been reading one of the books, one of the books that they permit me. Sometimes I read it to my sisters. They also find it delicious. Quite a great deal occurs. It's a great book. I think you would enjoy it. It's called The Old Testament. There's a woman who disguises herself and chops off a man's head. There's a man swallowed by a whale. And there's a man who's cursed every which way he's very unlucky. And he curses God, imagine. And then he accepts his lot and finds peace. My sisters, they told me that there is a man here in Horta who gave them a newspaper with pictures all about the people and politics. It's part of the new way of thinking in France. He said, and soon we will have it in Portugal, democracy. He said, we should kill our own king. He said, I would be set free of this cape. Imagine, we have a cousin in Brazil who sent us money. The first thing my parents bought me was this cape. Why would I want to be free of it? I don't know why my parents chose me. Of my sisters, I'm not the oldest or the youngest. I'm not the smartest or the prettiest, but I'm the luckiest. Thank you. Fantastic. What a great piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to um, we're going to bring back uh, Christophe, and then we'll go to our second round of poetry. I know that. I know that uh, Sam said that was the only poem he's going to read, but I think we have another poem from Logan, Lara, and uh, Jose Raposo. And also, of course, then we'll have the uh, piece um, the uh, piece by uh, Elaine that she'll explain to you a little bit before we go into it as well. Okay, so I, uh, Christophe, welcome uh, back. Uh, and we are happy to have you back with another song. Um, I, I must say that last week as we... Uh, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute does a radio show daily. Uh, some of you have been my guests, and I thank you for it. Um, it's kind of a unique project. It's a lot of work, but uh, thanks to all of you. It's uh, uh, it's not as hard as uh, as it should be. And so last week, um, throughout the last three days, Wednesday, Thursday, and or I should say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for obvious reason, because Friday starts with an F, it's Fadu Friday, so, you know, radio stations do that, so, um, but the other days, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we feature the music uh, of uh, Christophe, and um, I can tell you that I hardly ever get any phone calls or any, or, or any suggestions or any, um, or any emails, because folks, um, 
traditionally don't do that in the Portuguese American community. The show's in English, uh, as all of you know, and it's uh, four or five. It's called a very, very generic name, the Portuguese American Hour. And uh, we usually play three, not more than three or four songs. Uh, it's a lot more of a talk show uh, per uh, episode, you know, per 60 minutes. And we play three on Tuesday and two on Wednesday and two on Thursday from Christophe and I got some excellent comments. So hopefully we can get you more introduced into the American audience. Thank you for that. That means a lot. Uh, before I play this song, I actually want to say that I'm completely blown away by uh, the beautiful poems you guys are reading. Uh, that's that's really, really good and, and a great surprise. I, I was really, I, I was really not aware of how many people were writing such good poetry uh, over there. And, uh, and I find it amazing that you guys, without being here, describe this place so perfectly uh, with such fine imagery. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> so this, um, this song that I'll be playing is, is the song that uh, Scott uh, mentioned uh, a while back. It's uh, called Andra Tutsobene. Cities are vacant like they've never been. Everyone's scared of what blows in the wind. The plans we all had have all gone down the drain. Our lives were postponed, but I know in the end. All right. We stand together as one. People are lining in grocery stores, silence is screaming, fear in their hearts. Don't give up your fate, no, don't let your life fade. Together we'll get through the dark of these days. Two or three months, they're saying on TV, be safe in your shelters and soon we'll and they will remember the hardest times when distance meant love and it kept us alive. Andra tutto bene. Everything will be alright. Andra tutto bene. Everything will be alright. Doctors and nurses and all those who fight, the heroes that save us by risking their lives. We'll give them our love, yeah, we'll shout to the skies. Brothers and sisters, we're here by your side. Take care of our loved ones, be strong and be brave. Your kindness is something that cannot be paid. And when this is over, the memories will shine. Of those who passed on and those who stood in line. A few more months, the anchor man said, Divided we fight, but united we stand. One day we'll remember the hardest of times when distance meant love and it kept us alive. Andra tutto bene. Everything will be all right. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Fantastic. And I think Scott's going to continue the conversation a little bit. Yeah, so I just have to ask, what was it like to have this kind of overwhelming response to that song? I mean, it was it was uh, quite 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 moving. It was, it? It was um, to, to be honest, it was a bit a bit bizarre because um, <laughs> because you know I I wrote this song from the same place that I write everything else, uh, mm -hmm. which is out of. Uh, I guess you guys probably do the same. It's out of out of a sort of a necessity to to um, to 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 write um, what's what's on my mind. It's my way of of, of going, and uh, and uh, I did it in this exact room, and uh, in it it was just a reaction to what was going on in uh, in those first few months where we were watching all those images from Italy, which were very strong and, and mm -hmm. dramatic. And we were all scared and wondering what was in the future because now, now we look at it and it's, and we know a lot more about it than we did at the beginning. So uh, I, I wrote it from definitely from a, standing at a different place where, where we all are now, uh, knowing mm -hmm. much less than we do now. And, um, and it was just a reaction and and I sent it to Pedro Varela, the director, because he's a good friend of mine and we've worked together in several projects in the past. And he's he's a person that I consider to have a sense of uh, awareness about about knowing if if cer certain things f fit in, in certain moments. And I really wanted his input on, on this song. Mm. And he was over uh, enthusiastic about it and he said, this this song really needs to come out really fast and and um, it's uh, it it carries a very hopeful message that can be important and uh, and uh, I want to be a part of it and and I think we can put together a video with the new reality that every, that everyone is facing. So he said, uh, just reach out for all your friends across the globe and I'll reach out to mine and we'll collect footage from everyone's homes and we'll put together a video about this odd reality that we are living now and um and i re immediately thought i don't know what friends do you have but from my friends i'm pretty sure i won't get anything decent um but because he's uh <laughs> but because he's in the in, in the film industry and he knows so many people he actually got a lot of good footage and he had friends who lifted drones in different cities across the globe and he managed to put together this this video so fast, and it was a, at an incredible pace. And at the same time, I was finishing the lyrics to the song, and then within one week, we had the whole thing together. And and we didn't have any plan of of anything. We just posted it. We there was no marketing or anything behind it. It was just posting a song, and we did. And the next day, uh, my girlfriend got a a uh, video call from uh, a cousin in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. And uh, she pointed the phone to uh, the backyard of, of her neighbor. And uh, her neighbor was playing the song and she said, this, I don't know this man, you should know this. Like, I don't know this person, this is actually everywhere. And uh, that that is when I became aware of, of of what the song had done by itself, like the, what it traveled, and it, it and it was all very weird because I, I guess this is weird in any situation, but it, it is extra weird when you never leave your apartment, and right. and you're right. going. I spent almost a month doing interviews with with massive massive uh, publications across the globe and 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 never left my apartment <laughs> so i i really have no words to describe how bizarre that month was and right. um you know it, it, it was very it was amazing and bizarre at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an incredibly moving song and the video is as well. So if it, it, those of you watching, uh, go check it out. Uh, it's really worth it, it. It'll bring back a lot of feelings, of course, uh, about the early part of the pandemic. But now that we're starting to come out of it, 
it's a uh, you know, it's good to be reminded of the hopefulness that uh, that you brought into the world. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. And we'll be continuing to promote your music. And we need to get you to the United States soon after this whole, the new normality, uh, you know, begins. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. And we're going to continue with our poetry reading. And uh, we're going to go uh, back the same kind of the same order. Um, and uh, so we have um, uh, Lada, we'll start with Lada and, um, and then Logan and then Jose Raposo. And uh, of course, we will have also Anthony and Scott and uh, the interview also by um, uh, by Elaine. So uh, Lada. Okay, I'm going to go to Flores now. And a special hello to um, Gabriela Silva. I see is in the audience. Uh, I was in Flores Island and, and uh, met you at that time and, and I never forgot our visit. Um, during the time I was on Flores Island, it was a footpaths. It was a writer's residency and I was there a whole month. And that's where I got most of my poems written for my book, Kissing the Bee. And from that book, I'm going to read you about uh, 2008 Flores Island, the Azores. She walks a footpath, comes upon native species, finds restless slopes. On the hillside, veined with blue floral hedges, a sting of mint in the air. Rain, she senses at the edges of her thoughts, weighs clouds down. Rainwater turns to mist, to air, to time passing, days, years, this moment. She catches the glint in a rabbit's eye, a spiral of vapor, ghost-like, vanishes among crags. The caldera's green eye stares, watches her lose herself in a waterfall. She plunges wanting to see how far she can go, wanting the shock of going under. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful poem. And uh, the, uh, um, thank you so much, Lana. It was, and uh, I understand that you just took actually, I follow you of course on social media, you just took a break and you were writing for a couple of days there. Yes, yes. Uh, wonderful. Yes looking forward to seeing you thank you so much and uh logan never been to floridish but every time i hear lighter's poems i feel like i'm right there it is so this uh this next poem brings us back to new bedford actually and it's inspired by a painting from a very very talented up-and-coming portuguese american artist here on uh, in the southeastern part of Massachusetts here, where I'm from actually in Taunton. And um, if I have sharing capability, I'd love to project it while I read the poem, if, it, if it's possible. It is, let me just change something. Everything is, is possible. Well, not everything, but most things, you know. Uh, let's see, what is the old thing? You know, you're an American, you become president. Well, some, most can't but some will uh okay let's see here let's see and some shouldn't but do uh the present part i'm talking about the uh, okay let's see uh, i'm trying to make you co-host here am i on now no i'm we're waiting for um i need to uh make uh okay just a second okay here we go It should work now, Logan. Let's try it. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So are you seeing just the painting here? We are. Okay, wonderful. So the, the title of this poem is after the title of the painting, which is Into the Fog. Fishy hands on rusted cleats. Weathered eyes from a weathered vessel fix firmly astern on a growingly distant New Bedford port. Metal moves metal 
and hums a tune only a fisherman may fancy as melody. At Port Bow, Butler Flats offers a friendly smile and sense of direction through the morning mist. Through broom that blends with salty squalls, she kisses the vessel and its crew with her light, wishing them fortune in a safe way bound. A kiss like the one Salacia so often gave to their exposed fingers and to their bones, despite the burliness of their bibs. A kiss like the one they gave their daughters this morning who still dream with dry sheets and fluffed pillows. Two crewmates stand astern, watching waves become wake, their arms tucked into their overalls, their fingers hugging their thumbs. Outward bound and underway, they face the fog, head straight for it. They laugh at the, sa at the safety of solid ground and puff their chests to the songs of sirens because metal still moves metal, still hums its tune, and the sailors sing of home. Let's see if I can unshare share here. There we go. Wonderful, wonderful. The presence of the Azores and of course the New Bedford is, uh, is part of the 10th island. Um, from uh, Logan, we will go to José Raposo. Now you're on, José. Okay, uh, first, I would like to apologize for uh, looking distracted. But when I had a good memory, I would hear a word or a phrase, and then I would write a poem. But now, if I don't um, write something you know, or, or uh, record it about what I heard, then I lose it. And Christovan, uh, said uh you made a sentence in which you uh, said the words surrounded by music and aromatically it came to my mind to write a poem about surrounded by music and that music comes in so many different ways i, I am not a rich person but i say that uh, my uh, one of the only regrets I have is not knowing how to play an instrument and not being able to sing. I can sing, but I sing so bad that when I'm taking a shower, the water stops. Uh, anyway, so automatically I thought about writing a poem surrounded by music. And that's what I'm going to read. The trees move, the birds sing. I feel the wind, the flowers dance. The breeze brings to my soul the fragrance of the flowers. The air of the little girl moves at a rhythmic compass. I savor the mist of the Atlantic waves coming from afar. Everything is much more beautiful, surrounded by your music and the sound of your guitar. Wonderful. That's the uh, that's the improvisador part of you that can write uh, yeah, as we go along. I, I, that's right. There you go. I yes. cannot explain yeah, that's it. A you know, that's the country. That's the country singer. I, I, you, you know what? me very well, Denise. You know, <laughs> I, I just I don't know. Fantastic. Thank you. I hope you like that and don't hit me with your uh, with your guitar in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and from Jose, thank you, Jose. Wonderful. We'll go to um, so we have. Um, uh, of course, Anthony Barcelos, and we have uh, we're named with Scott Edward Anderson th this part anyway. And of course, we have also still Elaine Avis, so stick around. We have a lot uh, still going on, and we it is a wonderful way. Thanks to all of you who are part of this to celebrate the Azores. I mean, to celebrate the Azores in California, in Massachusetts, in uh, uh, British Columbia, you know, in 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 Vancouver area to celebrate it throughout those folks who are on the Zoom webinar. Uh, in different parts of Canada, different parts of the United States as well. And uh, also wanted to make sure that those of you who are following us who are writers and poets, we have quite a few participants on the webinar. We'll talk about it. This uh, The reason why these folks are here is because they are the founding members, but this is in by no means uh, a, a, a group uh, only for those of us who are here. It's for everyone, and we want everyone to participate, and we'll be doing lots of these events with everyone that wants to be part of the colloquium, uh, uh, of the Kagaho colloquium. So um, we have um, 
writer Anthony Barcelos. If you ever want to read a good book or reread a good book, it's called Land of Milk and Money. And um, and uh, Anthony reminded me on chat that he's not a poet, of course, but po uh, lots of uh, prose is also poetry as well. And Anthony is um, is a writer of the Azorian experience by in in, in uh, by no stretch of the imagination that is an exaggeration at all. It is not. It is he is a writer of the Azorian American, especially the Azorian Californian experience. Uh, it is all over land of milk and money, of course, and um, and maybe some future things that Anthony is always working on. So Anthony Barcelos. Thank you, Denise. Uh, it's rather mischievous of him to put me on the spot as someone who is poetry challenged, although perhaps I'm a representative of those people who can write, but don't have rhythm in their heads. So it's an honor to be here. Uh, I feel rather like uh, the goose among the swans, or or perhaps um, perhaps I'm the sherbet course in the, in the <laughs> midst of all the rich uh, dishes in a sumptuous feast. But it's not like our palates need any cleansing because everything is at such a high level. What I have to contribute is a scrap of prose about an Azorian kind of situation that I encountered as a child and changed it to a fictional account. And it's called The Wrong Grandmother. And it involves two boys talking. And so here it is, The Wrong Grandmother. I have the wrong grandmother. Huh? What is that supposed to mean? Ferdinando thought for a moment before venturing an answer. It just means that my grandfather didn't mean to marry my grandmother. Now it was Paul's turn to wrinkle his brow. He and his cousin were sitting on the haystack, fearlessly dangling their legs over the side. A flatbed trailer below them showed the fruit of their labors. The boys had pushed 32 bales off the top of the haystack and restacked them on the trailer two deep in two rows of eight. Each bale weighed over a hundred pounds, making it a little heavier than Paul, a little than Ferdinando. Each boy had wielded a pair of wickedly pointed hay hooks to wrangle the bales into place. Later, the trailer load of bales would be used to distribute hay to the cows for the afternoon feeding. That doesn't make a lot of sense, Ferdy. Are you saying that your avu married your ava by accident? By mistake? No, not that. I mean, he was engaged to a girl back home. In the old country? The Azores. Yeah, back home, said Ferdinando. Paul thought it was interesting how they had picked up the expression back home to refer to a place that neither of them had ever seen. They had learned the phrase from their grandparents and it was a natural part of their language. Anyway, continued Ferdinando, Avu worked for a few years until he thought he had enough money to get married. So then he wrote back to his girlfriend to come to America so they could get married. But when my Avu wrote back to get his girlfriend, he didn't get an answer from her. He got a letter from her father instead. Uh-oh, said Paul. Right. The father said that my Avu's girlfriend got tired of waiting for him and married someone else. Ow. Yeah, but then in the letter, the father said, she has a sister. You want to marry her sister instead? My avu thought about it and said, yes. So my ava isn't the ava I was supposed to have. Good story, Ferdy, but you're forgetting what we were talking about earlier. If your avu had married someone other than your ava, you wouldn't even exist. I'd be talking to someone else. Ferdinando screwed up his face in a combination of deep thought and existential distress. That is creepy. You wanna hear something even creepier? Your mom wanted to marry my dad and my mom was supposed to marry your dad. Mom told me that it was your aunt's idea. Neither one of us would exist or maybe we'd swap places. You're welcome to my brother, said Ferdinando. No, no, thank you replied Paul. I'll stick with my own brother and sister. 
I don't want to think about this anymore, said Ferdinando. Then think about this, suggested Paul. Avu told me what bachelors did when they wanted to get married and didn't have fiancés waiting for them back home. What did they do? Avu said that the men would go shopping for a bridal gown. They'd mail the dress back to their parents in the Azores and ask their folks to fill the dress and send it back. Ferdinando and Paul burst into laughter. Oh, that's a lovely piece. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> that's a lovely because piece. Because I, re I remember that things like that. Oh, my God. I was supposed to marry somebody else, too. <laughs> <laughs> Muito obrigado, José. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. That was lovely. That was very, very, that was lovely. Fantastic. And that is why um, the Azorian American experience is written in uh, poetry and prose in various genres, in uh, fiction, of course, in autobiography. Uh, we have excellent autobiographers in the Portuguese American community uh, and the Portuguese Canadian community as well. Uh, and so the Azorian diaspora is written in many, many different genres. And uh, hopefully that's just one of our missions here of the Kagahu Colloquium is to uh, take these genres and um, and promote these wonderful uh, creators such as Anthony. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Scott Edward Anderson, uh, who actually started off uh, not by reading a poem, but by introducing uh, Cristóvão and by having a short little conversation with him. And um, and as I said, uh, Scott is the padrinho of the uh, Cagarro Colloquium because he <laughs> baptized it with the name. So, uh, and, and he can do the call, which by the way, he'll teach all of us. Okay. I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to read uh, a section that will have that call in it, uh, at least my interpretation of that call. Um, so I have um, the last uh, four or five years, I've been re heavily researching my family history in the Azores. I did not grow up knowing much about it because my grandfather, who was born here uh, in America, wanted to be an American. So he assimilated and didn't really share any of the family history uh, with either my mother or, or me or anyone else. And um, so I've been on this journey and one result of that, because um, like my former teacher, Gary Snyder, um, I, I write to know what I'm thinking. And so one of those pieces is a book that was just published in the Azores uh, called Azorian Suite. It's a bilingual uh, book length poem divided into uh, sections. And I'm just gonna read two short pieces from this. Um, one of which will um, give you a sense of what this journey is, is doing to me uh, as a person and, and uh, how the Azores uh, have affected me. I have been captured by the islands like a cloud caught by a mountain peak, captivated and mesmerized in that original sense of being pulled by a strong magnetic force, pull of my ancestry, luring me back. In my dream, I am flying. I am flying in a caravel above an island in the sky. There is no ocean, only sky. And my caravel transforms from ship of discovery into a whaling bark. Then, tethered to a sperm whale, we circle our island home. The island is a cloud, or the cloud is an island. Someone fires a cannon, but what is launched is poems, not cannonballs. That's when I wake up. And now uh, the Kagaro. So I first came across the Kagaro uh, on the island of Piku, and um, was just, I mean, the sounds, the, 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 the cacophony is the only way to put it, that, that this bird makes um, is just amazing. It's astounding. And the things I heard in it that it seemed to be saying was just so powerful um, that I had, to, I, I had to try to imitate it. <laughs> so, so here goes. 
Sweep of the quarry's shear water overhead, cacophony of the cacajo, as it is called on these islands. Overhead, cackle and throaty warble, like a bleating sheep or wailing baby. Awa, 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 awa. Or waka, 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 waka. Once you hear the flight call of Calanectris borealis, you will never forget it. Calanectris, from the ancient Greek, kalos, meaning good, and nectris, meaning swimmer. Good swimmers, indeed, spending much of their lives at sea. The females go out to sea each May in search of food to help feed her one egg within returning to the islands to lay that single egg, which hatches in late July. Come October, November, the nestlings fledge, a dangerous journey with island lights leading them in the wrong direction, prompting the Azores government to launch a program called SOS Cagajo, ensuring the juveniles make it out to sea, longitude and separation. Is the island a cloud or the cloud an island? Impossible to say, but the Cagajo's call is unmistakable once you decipher what it is. <laughs> I won't even attempt, but it's well, excellent. excellent. Oh, come on, excellent Denise, you must. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I won't even attempt, you know, but the other day I must say that uh, we were in an event um also you know everything is in the zoom world nowadays and it was an event put forth about to commemorate the 25 de abril and uh and uh, and scott read uh, this poem and uh, another poem as well and uh, and when scott read it i have to say that um uh Anibal peters did an excellent job in 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 replicating the sound uh, from a, with a portuguese accent <laughs> And so it was uh, very well done. Thank you so much, Scott. Lovely, uh, lovely, and a lovely book of poems. And as uh, as it was reminded here on chat, uh, indeed, um, uh, if you read Azorian newspapers, the Azores Sources has an excellent article on Scott. Congratulations, Scott, and an excellent interview with Ismael Cabral as well. Congratulations, Ismael, she's on here as well. And that's what we need to do a little bit more. And that is one of the things, one of the parts of our um, community, the Kagaho Colloquium, is to make sure that the Azores as, uh, knows a little bit more about the Azorian American writers and the creativity that's going on there. I think Christophan touched upon that when he first said that he was unaware of everything that was going on. And I think we need to be, just like the Azorian writers need to be known a little bit better, quite a bit better in the States, we need to have that communication and, uh, and uh, the opportunities for more interviews and more pieces done on uh, uh, writers of the Azorian diaspora, whether they be in the United States, in Canada, in, in Bermuda, the ones who still are tied to the Azores in Brazil, rich, rich, rich history in Southern Brazil, as we all know, and uh, in other parts of the world as well. So thank you so much, Scott, appreciate it. And we are going to uh, have uh, Elaine um, explain to us a little bit about what we're going to have in this video, and I'll try to put it up if I can't. Elaine is also co-host, so one of us, between Elaine and I, will figure it out. Thank you. Um, when I was on my Fulbright in 2019, I wanted to discover what Azorians think, what how Azorians feel about lots of things, and uh, sometimes people won't tell you right away because there's so many tourists now to the Azores, right? So I was really seeking for um, the Azorian voice at first. And one of the first places that I found it was in Miolo Gallery. There's an artist there named Mario Roberto. And I saw some of his work uh, uh, around the Capello y Capote. So can you see that? So it's like aliens. You don't know what's going on in there. Um, and then this one I really enjoyed so much that I ended up writing a piece for it. And uh, once the pandemic began, I, I wanted theater to be even better on Zoom. So I got a little CalArts, uh, I'm an alumnex there, a little seed grant to start making short videos. And so this is a beautiful video made by the head of acting at CalArts, Marissa Chibas. So that's what we're going to share now is her video of my monologue inspired by Mario Roberto. 
Okay, wonderful. Let me see if I can get this to, I, it's not popping up on my end here, but let me just be patient with me. Um, scary, someone in the chat said. I know, no one knows what's going on, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of an alien. <laughs> okay, some... Um, Just wanted to say that there's actually still one lady here in Tersaida that uses that. You're is kidding. That, is that right? Yeah. I yeah. thought I'd found the last woman. I, I thought I'd she, found the last she woman. She probably is. And I, I'm pretty sure that she was, uh, they did a documentary about it. Uh, she's, she's from uh, Fontinha. Oh, well, maybe I'll reach out to you so I can. No, she's very, she was. She, the last time I saw her, I don't know, it, it was a while ago, but she uh, she used to be at her window. We're talking about a very, very old person. So yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if, 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 if this woman is still alive or not, but very recently she was. And, uh, and we, I worked a while as a tourist guide here. So people were fascinated by that. <laughs> Does she wear the manto? The manto, the one yeah, that gathers yeah, up their waist. Used to be at the window, yeah. looking like like the those pictures you have there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I thought the last one was in the '60s, so she's the no, no, she, no. she wins the prize. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> why, but yes. All right. I hope we can see this. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, so let's uh, try to see, and see if hopefully the sound will be here as well. I've come to warn you. Don't order the Prato do Dia. You'll be tempted. It's Azorian. It's fresh. It's exotic. A fish you've never heard of. Imagine how it will taste. Ooh! It's not that expensive. But, querida, there are costs. And by costs, I mean consequencias. Don't. Truth be told, I was already partly made of whales. My great uncle, my grandfather, my great grandfather, all whalers. We used all parts of the whale. We'd boil the blubber into oil and use it for fuel, lamps, Machines, perfume, soap. We'd wash our bodies with it, whales seeping into our skin. And the bones, we'd grind them into flour, feed them to our cattle, fertilize our plants, harvest, roast, feast. When we'd kill the whales, we'd open their lungs and breathe their air, be covered in their blood, smell the things they ate, touch the waters they swam in on their skin. Now they're us. But I had no idea until the Prato do Dia. Daily special, huh? More like Eve's apple. It was delicious. Maybe the best thing I've ever eaten. Crispy, tender, lemony, briny, lightly seasoned. But then I found myself walking, walking, walking drawn to the sea and my feet, step by step, they changed. And I slipped into the waters and swam miles and miles, drawn all the way to the Azores. Paradise, I thought, gasping for air, ducking up from the sea, green, blue, black lava, red roofs. The middle of nowhere, more like. It took all my human instincts to battle what I had become and swim, fight, thrash my way home. I couldn't walk anymore. 
A fisherman dug a hook into my mouth and chucked me in the back of his truck. I rolled out and flopped, gasping. People wanting to catch me and turn me into... O prato do dia. Since then, I've covered up. Consider yourself warned. Don't order the dish of the day. And if you do, don't eat it. Unless you are prepared to know who and what you are. Unless you're ready to... great thank you elaine thank you that was a fantastic that was wonderful piece thank you uh thank you for sharing thank you for for uh saving it for this uh this uh, this event i appreciate it we all appreciate it very very much and uh we come to the conclusion of our celebration of dia dos osores and launching in the kagahu colloquium I want to just again read to you what the our mission statement is. Uh, thanks again to Lara and uh, uh, Elaine, and thanks to everyone. Um, the Gagaho Colloquium is a literary community of writers of all genres, uh, not just poets, Anthony, not just poets, uh, So, uh, or else I wouldn't be part of it either, uh, who advocate for and, resp and represent new and established writers of the Azorian diaspora and their literary contributions locally, nationally, and internationally. And so um, if any of you would like to add to that, to the concept of what we're trying to do, I know there's lots of folks participating here that are writers that have written immensely or either uh, academics as well. And we'd like to have this, it's a, uh, it's a very kind of um, loose movement and, and there's no requirements. It's not we're, we're going to ask anyone to pay a, a, a big um, uh, entry fee to the Cacao Colloquium, other than Anthony, uh, where, you know, uh, of course, because of the land of milk and money. Uh, but uh, uh, indeed, I mean, facetious, obviously, but no one, we are just a, a, we're just a group of people who uh, want to bring more awareness to the Azorian diaspora, the writers of the Azorian diaspora, whether it be there or here and in our own communities, because in, in a lot of aspects in our own communities, we don't know a lot about some of the writers. I would venture to say that not every single person in uh, Massachusetts uh, has gotten the pleasure of uh, listening to or reading Logan's work or here in California or in some of the other areas as well. Uh, some of our writers you know, and uh, and we have a unique group. Lada has just, as we uh, all of you know, is the poet laureate for one of the counties here in California. And that's just wonderful to have uh, a Portuguese American, an Azorian, a, Kaga a fellow uh, Kagahu, uh, a part of the Kagahu flock, as uh, as a poet laureate for one of the counties. We have 58 counties in California, and it is not easy to do this. Uh, so um, maybe that uh, we sh we we are we're very very proud, of course, of Lara and everyone else and all of their work. So hopefully that is exactly what uh, we want to do is to bring awareness, uh, as the mission statement says, um, their literary contributions locally, nationally, and uh, internationally. Um, and so uh, those of you who are joining us, who are writers, a lot of you, I think the majority of you are, whether you're in the Azores or here, I would welcome you to be part of our, of, of our loose group. We'll be sending out uh, Elaine sent me a, a, a bunch of names, which uh, as, as uh, uh, possibilities that might be interested, and I'm going to ask everyone to do the same. And so we'll be sending out lots of invites, and hopefully you can be part of it. We would like to do uh, virtually quite a few events, and eventually we'd like to do some in person as well. We're going to use as much resources as we can from the Fresno State Beyond uh, Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PBBI. Um, we, it's not like we have uh, a big, a lot of money or 
of big endowments, but we we will certainly uh, tap into all of our resources to help this project move forward. So I'd like to hear from all of you as well, if you'd like to, obviously. Lara. I just want to say that I, I've got a, I think I've got a few years on many of you. And for many years, I was writing by myself. There was no one else uh, that was Azorian or Portuguese that I was writing with. And, and I just love the fact that we have all these Azorian Portuguese writers. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy for that. Uh, I wish it had come earlier in my life, but I'm happy that Dinesh, you know, I thank you for bringing us together. Uh, that's wonderful. That is absolutely wonderful. And I think we're just going to go onward with great force. That's all I want to say. Thank, thank you, Lana. Anyone well, else? Um, I tried a few times to form a group. And uh, I, uh, when I mentioned this to Denise, uh, I'm really grateful, you know, that Denise is doing what he's doing. Because otherwise, you know, my idea or my dream, you know, we, are, we have never flown like the Cagarro flies. Uh, I, I really, I, I could never thank enough to Denise and to all of you. Okay. And I am sure there are many more of us out there and they never came out because they did not have the encouragement or the support of anybody. We'll hope to do change that and hope to have everyone. There's lots of veterans participating also uh, from uh, some of the names that are participants on the webinar, All everyone from our very good friend uh, and inspiration to all of us on Ezimu Almeida uh, to uh, many, many others, Manuela Marujo, Nancy Kotuzan, and um, just looking at the lists of the ones I know, if I miss someone, please let me know. But uh, so is Sue, is Sue Fagal Wilkinson, she's an excellent author. Uh, of course, um, uh, there are folks who are uh, writers or Esmeralda Cabral, as I mentioned. And so, uh, and of course, from uh, the beautiful island of Flores, our forever friend, Gabriela Silva, and uh, Professor André Correia de Sá from uh, the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And so, Eduardo Eusebio, who has been a staple here in Portuguese American community as uh, with the Luz American Education Foundation, and many others who are also on. Um, those of you who are in writing, we need you as part of the Cagahu Colloquium um, because we want to take this forward as uh, Jose mentioned a very good point, especially to encourage young writers to take the first step. And talking about that, I have must plug uh, Sam Pereira and two young writers who will be part of an event here on June the 3rd uh, as part of the uh, MFA, that is uh, Master of uh, Fine Arts, so that's not the Movimento das Forças Armadas in Portugal for the uh, Armed Forces Movement for the 25 de Abril. I had someone talk about that when the, the, the advertising went out MFA. They said, oh, there's a group of writers that belongs to the movement of the Armed Forces in Portugal. No, this is a different MFA program, the Master of Fine Arts. Um, and so we, um, that's actually, actually happening, I believe, Sam, June the 3rd, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and, uh, and to those of you who are here, if you, it, uh, there is a very, uh, very, uh, there's a five dollar fee for it's to help the MFA the 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 the, the movements, but uh, PB the um, the students and and uh, um, so there's a five dollar registration fee. But um, uh, we at the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute are providing um, uh, some assistance, and so if you need to, I'll be more than happy to be a PBBI guest. I can get you an entry code uh, to be part because we'd like all of you to be part of this and listen to Sam Pereira one of our Kagahu uh, uh, founders. And along with Sam will be two young ladies, uh, one just concluding her Master's of Fine Arts and the other one a freshman in the, in, in the Master of Fine Arts. So uh, Kaylee Camara and Melissa Medeiros, Portuguese Americans who are very excited to read for a Portuguese audience because exactly what Jose mentioned, you know, and what Lada mentioned, people are writing, but they don't, they don't reach out, they don't know. And um, when they heard about PBBI, they're excited, excited and nervous. They told me they're both nervous to reach to read to a Portuguese audience because they've been writing 
um, but not to an audience that, uh, and, and although I've seen uh, some of it, and it, there's lots of Portuguese themes that sometimes we don't think there are, but they're in there, and Azorian themes and, and, uh, uh, and the Portuguese American experience or the Portuguese Canadian experience. Any other thoughts before we end our event? I just like to echo uh, what you said, as well as what Lada and Jose said from the younger perspective. I know that, you know, sometimes being an artist, being a writer, it can be a little intimidating when you're young and trying to get into the scene. Um, you know, you wonder if what you write or what you create, you know, be it a poem, be it a song, be it a painting, if it's good enough to share. Oftentimes we're our worst critics. And, um, you know, to a large extent, that's, that's still me, even though I have participated in a few events. So I just want to make sure I, I send a message out here to any other young Portuguese Americans, because to me, this group is, um, you know, the larger objective here should be to empower young Portuguese Americans, young um, Luso Americans and Luso Canadians as well, to, to get out and share your work and don't be afraid to, to do so. So um, our Jangada is, is open to, to many more Kagahus, right? Kagahus flock and feed together and there's room for many more Kagahus on our Jangada, on our, our raft. So um, come on in, welcome aboard, right? Please, please, please join our, our events and don't be afraid. Anyone else? If not, that is a wonderful way to end it because, uh, and with a young voice as well. Uh, thank you, Logan. Uh, again, thank you, Christophan, for being part of this uh, unique celebration of Diga dos Osores, where we united Azorians from the islands all the way to the west coast of yep. North America. Thank you very much. Good luck to you. We'll be in contact with you. And as we try to promote your music here, uh, reach a wider audience because uh, you uh, certainly deserve uh, a very wide, uh, wide and international audience. Your voice is unique and, and you. your, and your creativity. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. As uh, Professor Manuela Marujo just wrote, Feliz Dia dos Osores a todos. And this is, of course, open to everyone. We say Azorian uh, diaspora. And what is an Azorian? Manuela Marujo, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is a lot more Azorian than some Azorians I know. And so it is open to everyone, whether you have roots in the Azores, you've been by the Azores, you've studied the Azores, you've taught Azorian literature, as Professor Manuela Marujo has. As, and uh, and so it is. Uh, an Azorian is uh, is a way is a way of being that doesn't mean just necessarily to someone who was born there or their parents or their grandparents or their great grandparents. So we're open uh, to all Azorians join the Jangada, as uh, Logan said, uh, and be a Kagahu. We want everyone to be part of this. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all for being part of the Dia dos Osores Day of the Azores commemoration, international one, and a different one at that. Take care, everyone, and we'll, uh, we'll be in touch, and we'll continue to. And we'll end it. I think the best way to end it is to invite Scott and anyone else who'd like to join in in that Kagahu call, because uh, I think Scott is a master at the Kagahu call. So let's end it, Scott. <laughs> okay. Ready? With some music. <laughs> with some music. <laughs> yeah, with some. <laughs> I, think, I think you're going to have to write a, a Kagaro song, Christopher, for us. All right. I'm gonna, on the count of three, we can all do the awa, awa, awa. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Awa, awa, awa. Nobody. I think everybody's timid, but everybody's uh, you know, everybody's yeah. on mute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Scott. For Jose, Jose. <laughs> and thanks okay, to all of you once you again. Guys. And awesome. take care, everyone. Have a Feliz Dia dos Osores. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Boa tarde, boa noite.